Thomas Massey is a Republican congressman representing Kentucky's 4th Congressional District since 2012. He was originally part of the Tea Party movement and has long identified as more of a libertarian Republican. When he ran first for Congress, he was endorsed by Ron Paul, among others, and there's a lot of things to talk to him about. We are thrilled to have him here. Con congressman Massey, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us tonight. Oh, I'm excited to be on your show, Glenn. Uh, I've been waiting for this for a while, and I doubt we'll get through all the material tonight. So uh, you, you start with what you want to talk about. Absolutely. We only have a limited time, which we, of course, want to respect. So let's delve in, and then we'll harass you to come back on and, and have a more a broader conversation. Um, so let me ask, start with this. Um, Israel is the country that, over the last several decades, has received more U.S. aid by far than any other country. It gets $4 billion a year. Every time it has a new war, the Congress, the president want the U.S. to pay for it, and the U.S. does. What is your view on the overall U.S. support for Israel in terms of money? And what's your view specifically of President Biden's new request for $14 billion more, at least to start with, to fund this new war? Well, let me be clear. I, I don't single out any country with my ideology. I don't support foreign aid. Uh, my position is that we are almost $34 trillion in debt. We can't afford to help other countries. A lot of times foreign aid is taking from the middle class in, in one country and giving it to the rich in another country. And in the case of Israel, their debt to GDP is in a better position than our debt to GDP. So I don't, uh, particularly with respect to Israel, I don't understand why we have to send them money from my constituents in Kentucky. But I'm not singling them out. Um, another position that I've taken where I don't single out Israel or any country is I don't support sanctions. I don't think they work. I think they, uh, they do punish the people that, in the country that you're trying to sanction, and they're a prelude to war. So, um, and also, when, you, when we write sanctions bills here in the United States, we're creating crimes for Americans to commit. You can't go prosecute somebody in a foreign country for violating our sanctions. You're talking about prosecuting Americans for uh, engaging in business. And finally, you know, uh, sanctions. By the way, I'm talking about isolationism. I've been described as an isolationist. I'm talking about the anti-isolationist position, which is when you do trade with other countries. And finally, I guess this would be the America first version for reason for not voting for sanctions is they drive up the price of goods here in the United States and limit our options. So I had a there. So I've been called to task. Sorry, just to why yeah. I threw sanctions in there is that kind of goes along with the same, uh, you know, uh, basket of votes that I've been criticized on with respect to Israel. And speaking of just applying this general principle, not specifically to Israel, but to United States foreign policy in general, you were one of many people in the House who opposed the Biden administration's policy of fueling and funding the war in Ukraine. There were five dozen other House Republicans who also did the same. I interviewed several of them on my show about their reasons for opposing that, and they said things exactly like you just said. The United States is drowning in debt. We can't take care of our own people. We can't secure our own border. We don't have the money to go around financing wars. It's not a good thing if we do so. Ukraine's not the 51st American state. It's not our responsibility to pay for their wars. And yet all of them that I'm talking about who were on my show opposing U.S. funding of the war in Ukraine suddenly turned around and now are in favor of the Biden administration's request to send another $14 billion to Israel. I know you can't speak for your colleagues, and I'm not asking you to, but... Why does the climate seem to become so different when the question is funding Israel's wars as opposed to other countries? Well, I think there's, uh, you know, just to lay it all out there, I think there's a religious attachment uh, to Israel that you don't see with Ukraine or um, gee, I hate to question motives, which is what you're asking me to do. Uh, the, you know, in, in Ukraine, it's a it's a war between two sets of white people for the most part. And um, it's different in the Middle East. And uh, I don't, you know, mean to question motives, but it's it, it seems to be a double standard to me. What you're pointing out is there a double there's a double standard. I, I can't speak for all of them why they would support a war in the Middle East and not the war in Ukraine. 
This is one of the things that distinguishes Israel, and this is something you've talked about and we've covered on our show and people have written books about, is you have a very, very powerful lobby. And as I said in the intro, I don't know if you heard, but there's a lot of powerful lobbies in, in Washington. It's totally legal to be a powerful lobby of the pharmaceutical lobby, the Wall Street lobby, the NRA, you know, Planned Parenthood, lots of powerful lobbies in Washington. But one of them is this pro-Israel lobby led by APAC. And APAC has succeeded before in removing members of Congress by financing their primary opponents or financing their general election opponents, people who they perceived as insufficiently supportive of Israel. APAC has directly been criticizing you in pretty direct ways, and you have been responding in pretty assertive ways as well. Why are you willing to incur the wrath of APAC over this issue? Well, you know, um, I think it is debatable uh, as to whether a foreign country, and I know there are ostensibly uh, Americans who are here that are part of APAC, but uh, you can still be an American and be working on behalf of a foreign government. And um, those people we require to register uh, when they interfere in American politics. So I'm not going to, I actually won't accept the premise that APAC has the right to uh, interfere in an American election on behalf of a foreign country. Uh, and if they do, there we have guidelines and guardrails for that which they seem to be exempt from. And I know they have all sorts of reasons for that. Now, back to my particular case. So there have been, as of today, 18 votes in Congress since Speaker Mike Johnson was elected. I'm not picking on Speaker Mike Johnson, but I'm just pointing out, the, you know, that's been a short period of time, six weeks. We've had 18 votes on the subject of Israel. We've voted on Israel more times than we've named post offices. Uh, and, you know, Congress's favorite thing is to name post offices. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, the first vote was a, a vote in support of Israel. And it was just a resolution. It wasn't a conveyance of money. And I voted against it because once you read into this resolution, it supported sanctions on Iran. I don't support sanctions, as I've already told you. Uh, I don't support expanding the conflict, like the American response immediately to this conflict between, uh, you know, Hamas and, and the government of Israel was to expand it to Iran. And I think that's the opposite of what we do, need to do. We need to con constrain it to geographically, hopefully. And um, the, the resolution, it, it also did other things like open-ended support of military assistance without saying that excludes boots on the ground. If you read this with a critical eye, you know, it was hard to vote for. So I didn't vote for it. it was one, I was the only Republican who didn't vote for it. And um, then subsequently, one of the next votes was a vote on $14.3 billion to send to Israel. And I didn't vote for that. Well, at that point, APAC started running ads in my district. And, you know, to your point, you know, it's politics. I'm, I'm not complaining that they're running ads. They want to do it. Let them do it. They're wasting somebody's money. They spent $90,000 uh, for two weeks. They put ads on Fox News, which is, you know, what my primary electorate watches largely. So they're targeting my primary voters. And then they put that on... Um, $50,000 of ads on conservative talk radio shows in my district. Then they did some Facebook, you know, social media stuff. And they were criticizing me for not being supportive enough of Israel. I think it was a waste of their money. Uh, but then there have been more votes since then, and they've attacked me on social media. That's fine. They've called me anti-Semitic for merely not voting for the foreign aid. They, I said in a tweet that I put America first, and they said that invoked some trope and so that I was anti-Semitic, which I disagree with. And then, you know, recently we had, well, uh, last week, we had a vote on something that supports Israel's right to exist, which I do support Israel's right to exist. Look, Glenn, if you want to form an island in the Pacific, and, and create your own country, I'll recognize your right to exist. <laughs> Countries have rights to exist, okay? But um, the, the problem with that resolution is that they said it's anti-Semitic if you don't recognize their right to exist. 
which I disagree with. And, and there are Jewish people who disagree with that. Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people disagree with that. And I said, you can't equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. You know, there, there may be a, a strong overlap between those people, but they're not the same thing. We have different words for them for a reason. And then um, they said, well, you're saying Israel's right to exist and you're equating that with Zionism. And he said, that's not exactly what the bill says. Well, this week they pass a bill or resolution that says anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Like they put it in even more clear words. And I found it ironic, or not, not too ironic. I, I actually wondered where some of these Democrats were for a while, but um, Gerald Nadler of all people gave an impassioned speech about why that, why you can't equate those two terms. Who and is very pro-Israel and to, the leading, or I think the most senior Jewish member of the House, but also somebody very yeah. pro-Israel. And yeah, he came out and said, you have Orthodox Jews, many of them, sects of them, who oppose Zionism on the grounds that it's incompatible with Judaism. But let, let me ask you, independent of whether you agree with that statement or not, that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, just on the principle, is it the proper role of the U.S. Congress to go around dictating to Americans which views that they might or not might not hold that are racist or bigoted or anti-Semitic? Why is that even a proper function for the U.S. Congress at all? It's not. The irony is, you know, we're in the Judiciary Committee and we're uncovering all these infringements on the First Amendment that were, were done at the urging of the government, you know, through the Twitter files and Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi. Uh, and we're, you know, on my weaponization of government committee. We, we've been uncovering that, yet I think that's exactly what this is. This is an attempt to squelch speech. Now, the First Amendment covers the speech you don't like. Um, it covers hateful speech. There are some clear, clearly delineated uh, examples of speech that's not protected, but uh, anti-Zionism, anti anti-Semitism, those are actually protected speech. I don't support either of those positions, but those are protected forms of speech. Yet some of these resolutions, uh, one of them sought to basically censure Rashida Tlaib, a, a Democrat representative, um, censuring her for words that she said. And then another one of these resolutions were sought to go to universities and, to, and two of the resolutions or amendments said that we were going to defund universities that had anything to do with allowing anti-Semitic speech to occur on their campuses. So I do believe that's a First Amendment violation when you have the federal government conditioning money uh, based on political positions or allowing certain types of speech. And that's been held up in the Supreme Court. That is a violation of the First Amendment. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.